Hello, my dear students. Welcome to a new episode of Science. This is Mr. Mahmoud Yusri. Today, we'll be talking about metals and metals and metalloids. So let's start. We have an introduction here that says the chemical elements have many properties that are different from element to element. Yes, we already knew this from the previous lessons, but there are some properties that are very similar among elements. Scientists divided the elements into three groups based on the similar properties. You must have known them. The properties or the groups are metals, non-metals, and metalloids. So let's start talking about metals. What are metals? About 75% of all elements are metals, and they are on the left side of the periodic table. Do you remember when the leaves the periodic table? Metals are on the left side of the periodic table. Metals share common set of properties, which are number one, metals shine when they are polished. Number two, metals conduct heat and electricity. And number three, metals can be shaped without breaking. So the three properties of all metals, they shine when they are polished. Metals conduct heat and electricity well. And number three, metals can be shaped without breaking. The more an element displays these properties, the more metallic it is. Some metals are more metallic than others, yes, for sure. A shiny surface is one way to identify a metal. All metals shine, yes. Most metals are shiny and many can be polished to be reflective also. Metal surfaces will typically reflect not only light, but also it will reflect some heat as well. Metals can conduct heat very well. Looking at the cookware in your kitchen, the cooking pans and so on, you will see that most is metal. A metal cooking pan helps spread heat evenly so that food can cook. Metals are also good conductors of electricity, especially copper, gold, and silver. Metals are also good conductors not only of heat but also electricity, as especially like copper, gold, and silver. As you can see, this is copper. This is a copper wire. Copper is shiny, conducts heat and electricity well, and also can be easily shaped into many different shapes. Metals are easily are easy to shape because they are malleable. They are malleable. Malleability is the ability to be bent, flattened, or hammered without breaking. So the term malleability means the ability to be bent, flattened, or hammered without breaking. Gold is a very malleable metal that even a single gram of gold can be flattened into one square meter. Can you imagine this? Gold is both malleable and ductile. A small gold nugget can be shaped into elaborate objects like these golden coins. Then let's move to other properties of metals. Metals are also ductile, ductile. Ductility, what is ductility? Ductility is the ability to be pulled into thin wires without breaking. Ductility is the ability to be pulled into thin wires without breaking. Copper is often drawn out into wires for conducting electricity in buildings and electrical equipments. Yes, we know this. Silver and the platinum are also ductile. Other metals like chromium, chromium is the hardest metal. Chromium is the hardest metal, while cesium is the softest metal. Cesium is the softest metal. You can compare the hardness of metals using Mohs hardness scale. This is a scale used to measure how hard a metal is. Mercury actually is the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. Mercury is the one that is used in the thermometers. If you have an ordinary thermometer, you will find the mercury inside it. Mercury is the only metal that is a liquid at room temperature. The ways metals tend to react with other elements the metals' chemical properties, they vary quite a bit. Like what? Some metals, such as gold, are very unreactive. Some metals, such as gold, are very unreactive. Other metals, especially the metals in the first column of the periodic table, like sodium and potassium, they are very reactive. When left outside, many metals will corrode. So we will talk about corrosion, being corroded or eaten from the outside. When left outside, many metals will corrode. The word corrosion, the term corrosion, it means when metals combine with non-metals from the environment. Like iron, for example. 
Do you remember when we studied iron, we said that iron reacts very quickly with the atmosphere and rusts very quickly. Iron corrodes by rusting, which causes the corroded iron to flake away. Iron corrodes by rusting, which causes the corroded iron to flake away. The most reactive metals corrode the fastest. Yes, for sure. Sodium and potassium must be stored under oil to keep them from, from rapidly combining with oxygen in the air because they are the most active metals. And we said the most reactive metals corrode the fastest. And there is a fact, you know, the Statue of Liberty, it is not painted. Actually, this green color comes from the corroded copper. Then how do we use metals? Some periods of human development are named after the metal that was commonly used at that time. For example, do you know the Iron Age? You must have heard about it. The Iron Age marks the time when humans first produced iron tools. Metals in these times were used primarily as tools, but also for jewelry and medicine. Can you imagine this? Today, metals are still some of the most important materials in our lives. Think of all the places you see metals, buildings, bridges, and utensils. Utensils are the kitchen tools and containers. Some metals can be used because they are strong and flexible. Iron is a great example for sure. Iron can be very strong and flexible when combined with other metals. When the iron combines with other metals, it can be very strong and flexible. You know the skyscrapers, the tall buildings, can be built to be hundreds of feet tall using this form of iron. These metals support the weight of the building itself and they allow the building to sway slightly in the wind, not to be blown over. If the skyscrapers didn't bend, they would be blown over. Also, there is another element, you know, aluminum. One of the most versatile metals we use is aluminum. Aluminum versatile means able to adapt. How? Aluminum is often, often used in mirrors because it is inexpensive, it is cheap, and it can be polished to be reflective. So aluminum can be used in mirrors. Also the aluminum foil, we already use it in our daily life. The aluminum foil wrapped around food will trap the heat inside by reflecting it. Also, Aluminum can be used to conduct energy cheaply, just like copper. Both metals are used in electrical wiring, in the water heaters, and also the radiators. Aluminum is easily coated with a thin layer of oxygen to prevent corrosion, to prevent reaction with other elements in the environment. Then we come to the use of metals in the medicine. Sometimes doctors place metals inside their patients' bodies during surgery. Do not be afraid. Artificial teeth or hips or even hearts can be made of certain metals. For example, doctors may put a metal pin inside the broken bone like the one in the picture. This metal pin supports the bone as it heals. Also, doctors may use metal staples to hold large wounds closed. Metal staples to hold large wounds closed. Whenever a metal is used in surgery, the doctors must be sure that the metal will not react with the elements in the human body. Yes, gold and certain kinds of silver and titanium are all safe because they are unreactive in the human body. Other metals are useful because of their reactivity, like the metals used in batteries. Batteries use the reactivity, reactivity of metals to release electrons, then generate electricity. Cadmium, nickel, zinc, mercury, lead, and lithium. These are all used in batteries. Cadmium, nickel, zinc, mercury, lead, and lithium. These are all used in these are all metals used in batteries. Then we move to elements that are non-metals and metalloids. Have you ever wondered why a wooden or plastic handle of a cooking pot stays cool even if the pot is very hot? Yes, this is because wood and plastic are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Then there is a term for the elements that are poor or materials that are poor conductors of heat and electricity, which is insulators. Insulators are materials that are poor conductors of heat and electricity, like plastic and wood. 
Then we move to nonmetals. Most nonmetals are located on the right side of the periodic table. Nonmetals have properties that are basically opposite to metals properties. Nonmetals have properties that are basically opposite to metals properties. Yes, beside being poor conductors of heat and electricity, nonmetals also lack the shiny luster that was for metals. Nonmetals also break or crumble rather than bend. Yes, they cannot be shaped easily. They break or crumble into small pieces. Many nonmetals are gases at room temperature. Also, still others are solids with many colors and forms. Bromine is the only nonmetal that is liquid at room temperature. Do you remember the liquid metal at room temperature, which is mercury? And in the liquid non-metal at room temperature, this is bromine. As you can see here, choline is a non-metal gas, bromine non-metal liquid, and iodine non-metal solid. So non-metals exist in all the three states of matter at room temperature. The most reactive non-metals are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. These four are the most reactive non-metals, fluorine, Chlorine, bromine, and iodine. The column in the periodic table following the fluorines column, you remember the fluorines column? This is column 17. Then column 18 contains unreactive gaseous elements. They are all gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. These elements are called the inert gases or noble gases because they rarely react with other elements. So these are the elements of Column 18, the inert gases or the novel gases, which are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Okay, then we move to metalloids. Elements get more metallic to the left across any row in the periodic table. Yes, we said that metals are on the left of the periodic table. So the elements get more metallic to the left across any row in the periodic table also elements get more metallic toward the bottom of any column. In the middle, the properties switch from the metallic to non-metallic. The elements at the middle points are called metalloids. Metalloids like boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and polonium. These are all metalloids. Silicon is the second most abundant element on Earth's crust. Silicon makes up about 28% of the crust's mass. Other elements, other metalloids are much rarer. Metalloids have properties that are between metals and non-metals. We already know this. Metalloids look like metals, but they are not as shiny. And they look like non-metal, but they are not as malleable and ductile. So metalloids are not as malleable or ductile like non-metals. Metalloids are semiconductors. The word semi means partially. The term semiconductor means it is a material that conducts electricity better than a non-metal, but not as good as a metal. So it is in between. We said that metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. Non-metals are poor conductors for heat and electricity. Metalloids are in between. They conduct heat and electricity better than non-metals, but not as well as metals. Metalloids vary in their chemical reactivity. Some metalloids are very reactive with metals and not reactive with non-metals. Other metalloids have the opposite. They are not reactive with metals and very reactive with non-metals. Look at some elements of the periodic table here. Do you remember when we said that the, the metallicity or the, the metallic property, it increases from top to bottom and it in each column and it increases from the right to left or at toward the left in each row. We have here aluminum, aluminum is a metal. We have carbon, do you remember carbon is a non-metal? Then silicon, silicon is a metalloid. It has properties between those of non-metals and metals. Then we have germanum, germanum is also a metalloid. Then we have tin. 10 is a metal. This is a proof that when you get down or to the bottom in each column, the metallic properties increase. And when you go to the left, also in each row, the metallic properties increase. 
then how do we use nonmetals and metalloids? Nonmetals are excellent insulators of heat and electricity. Air is mostly made of nonmetallic nitrogen and oxygen and can insulate heat very well. Also, your winter coats works by trapping air inside to keep you warm. Nonmetals in plastics insulate, you know, that the, the copper wires or the electric wires, they are covered in plastic. The plastic is made of nonmetal elements. Nonmetals in plastic insulate electrical cords and keep you from getting shocked. Then let's talk about other nonmetals like chlorine. Nonmetals vary in their reactivity. Chlorine, for example, this is a molecule of chlorine, Cl2, has a high reactivity that makes it deadly to small living things. So that chlorine is often added to drinking water and pool water to kill bacteria. Have you ever noticed the sharp smell at a swimming pool? That is chlorine. Chlorine kills bacteria in pools and it keeps them safe to play in. Then we come to another element, which is argon. You remember the argon? Argon is very unreactive. Even after being electrified or heated for many hours, it will not corrode metals. This property allows argon to be used in long lasting and colorful electric lights like this one. Then boron, you remember boron is a metalloid that can be used like both metals and non-metals. The fibers of pure boron are lightweight and very strong at the same time like some metals. Boron is used to strengthen modern aerospace structures. Then we come to antimony. Antimony is unreactive and a good insulator like some non-metals. Antimony is used in homes and businesses as a way of making things flame-proof. Flame-proof that cannot get burned quickly. Then we come to the last example and the most important one, this is silicon. Silicon and other metalloids are used to make computer chips that use the properties of semiconductors. Computer chips are the, the heart of the modern electronic devices. Yes, because computer chips allow computers to do math, draw pictures, and even translate languages. All this by the computer chips made of silicon. So now we came to the end of our session for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you understood this episode. Thank you guys and see you in the next one. Goodbye.